Hello again. Uh, I'm going to talk about. That's funny that I was the live thing I'm doing. On that. This has a slightly different title from the title that's on the agenda, but about the changing role of governing government. In his 2007 book, The Invisible Hand, Julian Legrand develops an argument about um, recent changes in the configuration of public services. He argues that there's been a radical shift in thinking um, about public service provision, which was originally designed at a time when there was greater faith that public sector professionals were public-spirited altruists, or knights, and public service recipients were rather passive and grateful. He calls them pawns. And Legrand calls this a trust model of public um, uh, public service delivery because within it, professionals were given autonomy over practices and budgets based on an assumption that they would deliver public services efficiently, responsibly, equitably, i.e. in the interests of those who they served. There were few directives from above and little need for mechanisms like incentives or lead tables designed to drive performance precisely because practitioners were believed to be intrinsically motivated, so driven by a sense of professional duty and altruism. Legrand says, knights are not told what to do, nor are they subject to market or quasi-market pressures. Indeed, they're not subject to outside control of any kind. They are autonomous professionals with almost complete discretion to make resource allocation decisions as they will. And Legrand contrasts this with what he describes as a mistrust model. So here the assumption is that public service professionals are self-interested knaves who can't be trusted to deliver in the interests of the public without some kind of intervention. So in this command and control model, direction comes from the top down, coupled with incentives and disincentives for good and bad performance or for compliance and non-compliance. And these incentives include things like financial gain, promotion, and the granting of greater autonomy for high performers. Uh, disincentives include such things as risks of demotion, redundancy, and the naming and shaming of poor performers. That's at the most extreme. Legron says that in theory, the strategy that assumes that all professionals are knaves ought to be more successful than one that assumes that all are knights. So if you assume that everyone is a knight, the problem is that you might be giving trust to people who are not trustworthy, i.e. who use the trust that they're given to further their own ends rather than those of their consumers, to use his language. If you assume that all professionals are knaves, then in theory, he says, knights ought to carry on behaving according to their altruistic motivations, while knaves will be reshaped by performance and incentive mechanisms to act in desirable ways. In practice, though, he notes that there are some risks. The first is that knights might be turned into knaves, i.e. they notice that they can be more successful if they reshape their actions in line with reward structures. The second, he says, is that knaves gain the system, i.e. they act in a manner that appears to be in the public interest, but in fact is self-interested. So they uh, meet or manipulate targets in a way that just gives the impression of good performance in order to advance their own end. And the third is that a top-down strategy of this kind might be effective in the short term and with simple targets, but it doesn't embed good practice in the long run, or, or it might struggle to meet complex goals. And to do so, he argues, what's required and what's, uh, what's occurred in most areas of public service provision is some kind of bottom-up reform. So a responsiveness to what consumers want, rather than a reliance on top-down mechanisms, whether they are professional judgment, as in the trust model, or the judgment of governments and senior civil servants, as in the mistrust model. So in this first option, voice, users are given opportunities to communicate what they want. Um, so in education, that might mean parent-teacher meetings, or formal complaint mechanisms, and so on. And the assumption is, that providers and professionals should respond to what consumers say they want. If they don't know, the model works rather poorly. So an alternative is choice. And the ground argument that the mechanism here is stronger. So 
users take their resources to the providers that suit them best. If a provider fails to deliver what the customer wants, it loses money. I'm going to come back to this framework, but, I've, but it's, proved, um, it's proving helpful in shaping our thinking about the emerging <coughs> findings from the study that we're currently undertaking, commissioned by norms on the role of the governing governor. So just some background on this. The research builds on um, interviews that Alison and I undertook several years ago, mainly between 2007 and 2009, as part of our study of senior managers working in public and private sectors. And at that point, our questions, which I've listed briefly here, were about who senior managers are, what their values are, what drives them, and the impact of their values on their behaviour and their establishments. The current study is smaller in scope, with some revised questions. In particular, what are the new demands of the job? How is the role of the governor changing? And what is it like in a rather different political and organizational context to be a governor? And we're asking these questions alongside those that we asked in the earlier study. So that's allowing us to make comparisons between the two periods and to extend some of our original thinking about professional ideologies and practices. In the current study, our interviewees are a mixture of people who we already know, some of whom we interviewed in the first study, but also some governors who are new in post and who are unfamiliar to us. As in the first study, governors have been exceptionally um, willing to engage with us. They've often travelled significant differences and distances to come here to the Institute to be interviewed, and they've been extremely generous with their time. No one has declined to be interviewed yet. And most have been um, keen to have an opportunity to talk and to contribute to a piece of work whose value they recognise. The fact that the study has the backing of the organisation has helped a great deal, not least because it's demonstrating the commitment of the board <coughs> to thinking about the current, um, about current challenges. We still have some interviews to do. Uh, so what we're reporting today, and this is the first time we're reporting our findings, is subject to change. This is work in progress, but we think that a fairly clear and consistent storyline is emerging. One of the main things that, that our first study delivered was a kind of oral history of the service. And this was a history that was recounted with very little nostalgia. So among <coughs> the main themes that emerged when our interviews described their um, their, 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 their professional, their, their careers, mainly from around the 1980s onwards, were deficits in the use of power, so both its, its underuse in high security prisons and its overuse in many local prisons and YOIs. Senior managers were very often described as having been weak and ineffective, especially in tackling staff practices that were described to us as often corrupt and unprofessional, and also in tackling a culture among uniformed staff that was often chronically and stubbornly regressive. And meanwhile, as Roy King and Kathleen McDermott exposed in their research into changes in prison regimes in the 70s and 80s, no one knew where the money was going. Accountability was extremely poor. The penal crisis, they said, was a crisis of management. As Alison and I have outlined in a couple of existing publications, all of this helps to explain uh, the drive towards managerialism that marked the service from the late 1980s onwards. So performance targets, managerial grip and competition were adopted and embraced in order to regulate and get a grip on working practices, on costs, on staff behaviour. So managing out abuse, managing in decency. Positive motives and intellectual brain power have proved themselves insufficient to guarantee good outcomes for prisoners. And in an environment in which, to quote from the final slide, the worst excesses can occur, it was unsurprising that more robust techniques of management were adopted. This is what was referred to by one interviewee as a form of benign Stalinism. All of this, then, is a kind of defence of managerialism and of some rather harsh management techniques, given the inherent risks of the prison and the real difficulties of managing intransigent, resistant staff cultures. But it's a cautious defence, because, as we've argued elsewhere, a distinction can be made between different forms or different areas of managerialism and the forms that it's able to take in different political and economic periods. So, 
with, with uh, what we call managerialism plus, was marked by explicitly moral language, the decency agenda, investment in rehabilitative opportunities, and so on. As finances became tighter, <coughs> as an economic logic began to dominate, and as um, notions of punishment and less eligibility were revived in political discourse, all of this became uh, rather different. And this is relevant to our study for two reasons. First, because we want to emphasize the relevance of the wider political and economic context to the kinds of sentiments and experiences that we're going to go on to describe. And second, because it helps to explain why a version of the mistrust model that Legrand describes seems relevant to the transformation and management of the service. So, on the one hand, I want to argue that the mistrust model is quite a helpful way of thinking about some aspects of um, prison service management. And on the other hand, uh, if we take Legrand's framework as our starting point, it's clear that prisons are, in many ways, anomalous areas, uh, an anomalous area of public sector provision. So first, while in areas like health and education, the relationship between the provider and the consumer is relatively straightforward and direct. In prisons, it's much more complicated. So prisoners, one might say, are users, but not consumers or customers as such. Noms is the customer. The public is a customer of a kind, but at considerable distance. And meanwhile, prisoners are a different kind of user from the school parent or the GP patient. So to draw on Legrand's terminology, they've never been grateful users or forms because, to state the obvious, ultimately their engagement with the service is forced upon them. The service has not been designed in their interests alone. Second then, mechanisms of voice and choice don't work in quite the way that Legrand envisages. Prisoners certainly have no choice in the way that he um, describes it. And although organisations like User Voice are beginning to alter some of these dynamics, uh, governors are still serving multiple stakeholders, only one of which is the immediate recipient of the service. What then does it mean to be nightly? <coughs> to whom should nightly motives be directed? Third, Legrand's model presents professionals as a uniform, i.e. as a single, uncomplicated stratum. In other words, he doesn't differentiate between staff groups within any one area of public service delivery. But we only need to think of the differences between, say, doctors and nurses to recognise that these sorts of groups who work in the same environment might have quite different interests and motivations. And in prisons, as I've already suggested, these variations in levels of nightliness and neighbourliness are all the more apparent. So senior managers are often nightly in their motivations but many fail to deliver good outcomes because they're ineffective in managing what can be rather knavish staff groups, or because they're not sufficiently competent to manage the distinctive tendency of power within prisons to slip into the wrong places. So, although, so while Legrand notes that knights are assumed to be both competent and benevolent, that needs a bit of unpacking. What's re what is required to be competent in an environment in which much of the management time <coughs> involves shaping a staff group which might be knavishly self-interested. We began to answer this question on the basis of our first study, and some of you will have seen this diagram before, which we developed as a way of trying to describe the values and styles that predominated among our interviewees. So the style axis ranges from soft consensual to hard robust, and the values axis ranges from social justice not to punishment, because we found no one for whom retribution was the main motivation, but internal order. And our argument was that harmony and security orientations operated rather than like this, so that believing in social justice and consensual management styles could be described as more harmony-oriented, and those governors who prioritised internal order and tougher styles were more security oriented. In general, we concluded, the balance in the service had shifted towards the security, tough management end of the diagram. So many interviewees were uneasy with some harmony-based orientations and with terms such as liberal, which were taken to imply laxity or managerial ineffectiveness. So old-style liberals, although their values 
and uh, intellects were often respected, tended to be seen as do-gooding and paternalistic. Um, and those interviewees who did describe themselves as somewhat liberal were less embarrassed, they said, about using power in <coughs> pursuit of their aims than the liberals they identified from the past, arguing that um, liberal goals, what we might call knightly aims, can only be met if you had a bit of steel about you, what we could call knave-like methods. And this came out too in our more recent interviews, a sense that to be a good governor requires quite a lot of strength of character. I think you have to be fairly tough. I don't mean tough in a hard way, an uncaring way. I mean, don't enter into this unless you're ready to fight some battles and go home feeling rubbish sometimes and say some harsh things to people, because I think it is a tough job. That's the first thing, and then I think it's essential that you have some care. You actually, I think you, I think you have to actually care about what you do. In the typology that we developed, we were struck by the fact that there were many more security than harmony-oriented positions. The majority of our interviewees fitted into the first two categories and the fourth. So, highly skilled operators who were powerful, driven governors, often fighting difficult staff cultures, managerialists, and uh, the group that we think found the right balance between principle and pragmatism, or perhaps between knightly aims and rather harsh means. So to return to the original framework, all of this is to say something quite important, that many of the governors who we think are most knave-like have favourable attitudes towards performance culture, and therefore a a model that Lebron would say uh, assumes that they cannot be trusted. So they recognise the value of performance culture as a way of driving change through a rather stubborn, made like culture. So like privatisation, performance culture has been integrated into a knightly philosophy. Its infringements on professional autonomy are considered worthwhile. One final point before moving on to some of the findings Legrand's framework is inevitably reductive. Most people are neither knights nor maids, but something in between. And again, this feels particularly complex in the prison world. So only a minority of interviewees have claimed to be altruistic. That might feel like a strange claim to them, given, uh, given the essential task in which they're engaged. Many governors have said to us that their initial motivations were uh, rather self-interested, so prison work is a nice way, a good way to earn a decent living, and yet they have described developing morality, deve developing their value orientation while in service. It's also not notable that despite downward flows of mistrust, most express very high levels of trust and faith upwards, both to the organisation and to their senior leaders. And that loyalty can be compliant and vicious, i.e. a self-serving means of advancing your career, but more often it's based on the personal qualities of people at the top, the fact that they've earned their operational spurs, that they know the service inside out, that they're seen to be steering the ship through particularly choppy political waters, and the fact that they demonstrate moral decency. So part of what drives people is a sense of loyalty and duty upwards, this might also relate to the, uh, the issue that I described a minute ago, which is the ambiguous status of the end user. So it seems to us unsurprising that while doctors might state that their primary loyalty is to patients or teachers to pupils, governors are less likely to say that their principal loyalty is to prisoners, although some do. So the point here is really to emphasise that this, this is a quite distinctive dynamic in which trust between governors and the organisation flows upwards, but rather less so downwards. When we were first asked to undertake this research, one of the main purposes was to ask governors about their readiness for imminent and ongoing changes in the role, in particular the growing um, role of contract management in the governor's task. But as suggested in this first quotation, our interviewees have said relatively little about this topic, noting that they've got used to this aspect of their work over many years. Instead, they're more preoccupied with immediate concerns, order, control, decency, delivery of purposeful regime. 
governors are saying that the, the job is as tough as it's ever been and that the weight of responsibility has never felt higher. Prisons are governable, they say, but on a model that sometimes feels as though the service has stepped backwards in terms of regime hours and service delivery, particularly in local prisons. Of course, some prisons, some governors are doing well. Some have welcomed the opportunity to identify and shed surplus or poor performing staff, and more than once we were told that uh, its staff have got fewer places to hide. It's easier to identify the ones that are lazy. But in general, the language is of survival, getting through the day, being in the bunkers, and so on. So to quote from the second extract, it would only take one bad decision to really set something off. Some governors are coping well, particularly those who find a way of creating distance between their personal and professional identities. The majority, though, are describing a deep emotional toll, so sleepless nights, the pressure of having to absorb the emotions of frontline staff, and the knowledge that everyone is carrying more risk. It's not ours, says the second interviewee here, it's the emotional drain and the complexity and difficulty with human relations and the worry you have about the people you lock up every night. You worry about your staff and you worry about your management team. <coughs> Alongside this toll is the experience of um, performance deteriorating. So several interviewees have talked to us about the difficulty of coping with failure for the first time in their career. So at a time, this is a quote, at a time when you probably feel you're working hard just to keep the show on the road. And as suggested in the second quote, <coughs> There's a sense that it's becoming very difficult to make things work. It does feel a bit like juggling jelly, if you look at the last line. So it's telling that the most common metaphor we're hearing is of spinning plates, because of the suggestion that at some point that task, um, that, that some may be bound to smash. Many are making the same point that Ian McClellan Murray made in his speech to the PGA conference last week, that they don't feel in control of what's happening, and however much their input, the context means it's very, that it's difficult to meet demands. So I think I've been working too hard, and I'm not sure that my effort is getting the outcome that's comparative to my input, if that makes sense. I think some of it is I'm just trying to fill gaps that I just can't fill. So Legrand emphasizes the role of competence and benevolence in the success of night, but neglects the possibility that in certain kinds of circumstances, External pressures may make the task of any professional uh, difficult, however capable they are, and whatever their motives. This is partly about resources. Although some interviewees have had much more positive experiences of benchmarking than others, it's also about a perception that the performance grip and demands coming from headquarters, in particular from politicians, are exacerbating operational pressure. So to read from the first quote, the performance department seems to be going, sort of going mad and adding things for us all over the place. That just means you've constantly got, to, you've constantly got to be focusing on them. And at a time when the service is going through such change, I'm wondering the wisdom of that. So what's important here is the suggestion of a shift from what I described earlier. So a growing feeling among value-driven governors that performance culture might now be obstructing rather than enabling good service provision. And all of this is generating considerable uh, amounts of soul searching. So we see this in the first quotation. It, sometimes it reflects feelings of self doubt and a concern that being a governor in the current climate requires a new modus operandi that's not yet discernible. So we're having to, to learn to sort of almost deliver while spinning the plates in a different way. This soul searching might also, also has a moral component. So here, the interviewee says, with governors who are a little bit more interested in the job, those are the people who I feel are most upset, who feel they can't make a difference anymore. They feel that actually they're not looking after people properly, and they're very upset about that. And one of us, I'm not sure who, asks, so all the people that you would most want to stay in are leaving, and the people that are staying are the ones you might want least. Yes, exactly, it's the very ambitious careerists who are staying in. Now, I think this extract overstates the case, but certainly we've been struck by the greater discomfort of the more values-driven and creative governors who we have interviewed. One reason why these governors are feeling alienated is because of the reduced discretion that they are facing as a result of 
increasing centralisation of, of budgets and staffing structures, and the feeling that this has reduced their ability to shape certain aspects of the prison about that certain aspects of the prison about which they care most. So this governor says it's an environment where you put someone in charge of the prison, yet they can't actually decide how many pairs of boxer shorts a prisoner can have. You say, do you feel your room for manoeuvre or discretion as a governor has been curtailed? Yes, in all those areas where I could have where I could have more of a say or an influence, or influence over things that prisoners could benefit from, how they can order their canteen, how much private cash they can have, and so on. Now, these interviewees still say to us that they, they do feel that they've got considerable power to influence the moral climate of their establishments, but less than before. And more importantly, this reduced discretion is experienced as a form of mistrust, as we see in this last line, that, that being limited in, the, in who you can recruit makes you feel like you're not trusted. And this theme of mistrust has been recurrent in our recent interviews. And I, this quote I think I'll read in full, I feel less trusted than I used to feel. I don't feel on a personal level like Phil Cockle doesn't trust me. I feel like the organisation is moving to a position where they say they trust us, but don't behave as though they do. By taking away our ability to manage our finances, for example, setting all the management structures for us. I understand we have to do fair and sustainable, but there isn't any movement in there. There's no wiggle room. They've standardised our budgets, and every year it goes by they're taking more and more to the centre. That really does make you feel as though they don't trust you. So, excuse me. <clears throat> and this tone is fairly typical. So most governors have explained that they they feel highly trusted and supported by their line managers and by the board itself in terms of their relationships with actual individuals. But that feels different, they say, from the way that the organisation operates, the machinery, particularly when it responds to poor performance or operational mistakes. So, to quote another source, what it feels like to be a governor is different from what's said. You're scrutinised. It's what happens when things go wrong. A further frustration for some governors is their feeling that their discretion is being limited, not because they themselves can't be trusted, but because of the actions of some of their less talented and trustworthy peers. To quote again, the service has made some of the changes as a reaction to those who can't. We've taken some of that control away from governors because we've proven that if you just give them complete control, we've not got the talent there to be sure that every prison will be as good as the next or as efficient as the next. We did these changes partly because we didn't trust them, and fundamentally because we needed to save money. Now we should shake the shackles, take the shackles off um, about what I have to have within that envelope of money, and let me move things about as I see fit. Do you think that most governors will know what to do once the shackles are taken off? No, unfortunately not. That's the dilemma. It comes back to those who can and those who can't. So as suggested in the second quote here, there's frustration about a perception that Poor quality governors, uh, that, that poor quality governors ought to be tackled on a more individual basis, and that organisational solutions are sometimes blunt. So some of this is consistent with Legrand's model. So a model is applied because of unscrupulous knaves and incompetent knights, and the risk for the organisation is alienating or changing the behaviour of knights who might merit greater autonomy. I'm pleased I called this like creative compliance rather than, what's, what's the term? Delin delinquent governance. I did this before <laughs> Alison used that phrase earlier. So in, in this context, some governors are seeking to exercise autonomy by stealth. So engaging in creative compliance, acting in a way that's consistent with the stated values of the organisation, but not always, they say, with its procedures. So. As suggested here though, this form of action, so acting in a knight-like way within a knave-like framework, requires personal confidence, trust from above, and an intelligent reading of organisational risk. So this interviewee says, I can get away with things partly reputational, partly because I'm trusted, but I'm not sure that everyone will get away with it or have the confidence to do it, actually. And he says, I'm not breaking any rules, and I know where the risk lies, and I'm telling the right people the time doing it. Our sense is that those governors who are most likely to be creatively compliant are not just more experienced and therefore more confident of their professional judgment, they're also governors who feel less dependent generally on the service 
who, who have a, a kind of cultural or moral hinterland beyond it in which their moral actions are anchored. Governors who are new in post or who have been socialized in an era of compliance uh, or those who feel dependent on their line managers for career progression are more likely, as we see in this second quote, to express a little bit of anxiety about bending the rules creatively. And this is also relevant to some of the new demands of the role. So governors, alongside reporting reductions in discretion, governors are describing a countervailing shift in which they're being asked to show more creative innovation. But they're tending to say to us that because they're being trained to be process driven and compliant, they're not quite sure about the movement to this new world. So again to quote, over the last 15 years, the service has cultivated a group of people who want to meet targets without really thinking any broader than that, and all of a sudden say, right, we want you to be innovative. And then governors say, well, if you've gotten an instruction on that, what targets for innovation are they? <laughs> I said as a joke. They can't quite get out of that way of thinking. You go to something like the Governing Governors Forum, and they stick you in a room and they say, OK, come up with innovation. And of course, everyone's just sitting there looking blankly at them. Most interviewees also report the challenges of leading significant organisational change. So something that requires strategic vision rather than operational mouse, and influence and skills rather than command and emotional intelligence, particularly pulling staff through a series of changes that are generating considerable stress and anxiety for them. Okay. So I just want to move on in the final section to talk about relationships between our interviewees and the people above them, in particular the norms board. I should start by saying that since some of those board members are in the room, <laughs> no one is more delighted than me that I can report positively in that regard. <laughs> so even in this context or this climate, views about the board are very positive. So, the degree of personal loyalty being expressed towards those at the top remains very high indeed, with little doubt about their personal values and an awareness that they themselves are under considerable professional and political pressure. At the same time, and at the risk of being denied access to prisons for the rest of my career, I want to flag up a few of the threats to the upward flows of trust and loyalty that I described earlier. And here I'm drawing on a fairly loose, in a fairly loose way on concepts that are central to procedural fairness in order to think about the potential threats to the internal legitimacy of the service as experienced by governors. So voice, that's the potential for expressing a viewpoint. Uh, neutrality, so consistency, lack of bias, uh, transparency in decision making, respect for, treat respect for treatment, and trust in authority, so that's faith that the authorities are benevolent, caring, and so on. So, first, one thing that's emerging is a sense that major initiatives such as benchmarking were initially implemented without much opportunity for governors to express their views and misgivings. And note in the second quotation the direct link that's made between this and feeling mistrusted. Feelings of voicelessness also relate to broader issues of organisational compliance. These could have quite different motivations. So, as we see in this quotation, some governors are keen to be considered corporate as a way of expressing their loyalty. So, there is, and there has been for a while, a real fear of not being seen as corporate enough. When I say fear, I don't mean fear really. I mean we want to be corporate. In a good way, we really want to support Phil and Michael. Most of us are very loyal to both. We don't want to be seen as difficult, not just for our career's sake, but because we don't want to be difficult. And I think there's a certain feeling of you knuckle down and make things work, and I think that's quite healthy. Others, though, are expressing concern that speaking out about organisational issues can affect their career progression, as we see in some of these quotations. A second threat to organisational legitimacy relates to the transparency and neutrality of personnel decisions, particularly promotion. So what's really struck us in doing this set of interviews is that governors notice and discuss who's being promoted, who's being passed over, and if they're not sure why, uh, a storyline emerges to fill in the information gap. 
and they interpret organisational aims and values accordingly. So one thing that's emerging is a perceived lack of transparency about promotion processes, including a concern in some parts that operational grip of a certain kind is valued more than moral leadership. So to quote from the second quote here, sometimes I feel they're rewarding the wrong people. There are two things that worry me. I've seen some people become governors that I think are bullies, and I think that the board know they're bullies, and that worries me. And I think sometimes that's seen as useful, unfortunate, but useful. And I don't necessarily think that the processes are always transparent. So for instance, some governors who are part of a consultative group have recently become DTCs. I have no idea how people get picked for that group. There's always been an issue about transparency, and we always get told it's an operational necessity that people get moved to this jail or that jail, and everybody understands that, but I don't think it necessarily explains the way we do things, and we wouldn't get away with it at a local level. A second perception is that some managers are bulletproof, while others are expendable, that loyalty is rewarded with protection and promotion, not so much at higher levels of the organisation, but within establishments, where, we were told, there are still governors who, quote, manage from the pub and the curry house with all of the implications that those terms imply. All of our female interviewees have talked about predatory men. That's partly because there's an, a discussion going on within the organisation about these issues. But they're talking about a wider culture of machismo and patronage. And it's striking to us that some of the language we're hearing about resilience and manning up may feed into or reflect this culture. A third concern, and we ourselves might be implicated in this, is that moral leadership has become a new kind of performance target. So, uh, so one interviewee said to us, there are a lot of wolves in sheep's clothing who know how to describe themselves using moral language because they've been told that that's what the organisation wants, but may be acting in a way that's inconsistent with that. And Alison and I have been struck on a couple of occasions that, or it struck us that, uh, we've suspected that interviewees on their way down to Cambridge to join us have rehearsed their own moral narrative because they know that that's what we're interested in hearing about. With regard to respectful treatment, most of what we've heard is positive. The main negative theme is a desire for more emotional support and more recognition and reassurance from line managers. And that's felt to be particularly important because of the pressures of the current environment. So, to read from this first quote, what I really wanted was for my DDC to turn around and say, you've worked really, really hard, thank you, and I didn't feel that I got that. It's just about recognising the scale of the challenge. Some interviewees have remarked that there are a few opportunities for them to share their feelings about what it is like to govern at the moment. And little appetite to do so with their peers. This is a group that is described, this is a set of practitioners who are described as pretty competitive. What they also struggle with is any suggestion that their feelings about how hard the task is are trivial or baseless. Many of the interviews, interviews that we've conducted have been emotional. Most of our interviewees have exuded commitment for their work. What they want, we get a sense of it from this second quote, is an appreciative approach towards the struggles of management. The final threat uh, that's worth mentioning here, it sits outside Tom Tyler's framework, I think, is a perception of dissonance or inconsistency, and that takes a number of forms. First, a concern among some interviewees that people at the top of the organisation are not entirely aware of what it's really like on the front line. It's interesting that those who have worked more recently in headquarters don't say this. They're saying they know how hard it is, but others who are more distant are saying things like this. But they're their perception of the service in terms of, say, decency is not necessarily, I was going to say, a life of reality, that would sound really harsh, but I think their view is slightly rosier of where we are than it is. My fear is that they might not realise how far some of us still have to come. I think those at, but the people at the top of the organisation do believe passionately in rehabilitation and decency. My hesitation is only that they might underestimate the challenge in terms of maintaining all of those things. Second is a perceived inconsistency between what the organisation is saying and what it's doing, i.e. between its moral language and aspirations and its actions. So in the first quotation here, a governor is describing the dissonance that results from being given a clear public message about moral leadership and at the same time feeling that the communications that he receives, or she, 
are about risk management and compliance. And in this second quotation, the governor is taking issue with the language of rehabilitation that he says feels a long way off in the environment in which he's working. A final point about, uh, is about how this is realigning loyalties and affinities at different levels of the organisation. So, uh, compared to our interviews in 2007 to 2009, it's, it's noticeable that governors are talking in much more sympathetic terms about their staff, uh, about their conditions of work and employment. So, uh, many are talking about, many are describing a kind of breach in the psychological contract between the state and public sector employees, and they are describing the difficulties of trying to engage staff at a time when staff are so alienated from their profession. So to do so, as explained in this first quote, they're saying, I have to split myself off from the organisation. And at the same time they're reporting that while they're being confronted with quite a lot of anger from frontline staff, many staff are expressing sympathy towards them. You know, I wouldn't want to be doing your job. So staff are saying, staff are recognising that the job of a governor is particularly difficult at the moment. Part of the challenge then comes from an expectation among staff that the governor remains a monarch of their own domain. So governors may feel that their discretion is diminishing, but that staff still see them as all powerful, um, and that they are still accountable, equally accountable to the organisation. So to quote again, it's quite hard to get to the position of being a governor, and when you get there and your staff look up to you and they expect great things of you, and they carry and they're carrying on having those expectations regardless of what the service does, and then the service starts taking away your ability to really make meaningful decisions, and that is quite hard. Uh, if that paints a rather gloomy picture, then it's important that I rebalance it here. Many interviewees continue to feel to recognise that they are extremely powerful, that the, that the chair of the governor retains a huge amount of influence and authority and that regardless of the limits that are being placed on them, they still have the power to shape what one of the interviewees here calls the quality of conversation on a daily basis. And I want to end with some other reasons for optimism. First, having expected that some of the younger, newer generation of governors might be excessively compliant or managerialist, we've continued to find energy, vocational passion and moral drive among our interviewees including in governors who are not on the organisational radar. And while some of the story that we've told today is about threats to the flow of trust upwards, we're also finding a large reservoir of goodwill towards those at the top of the organisation. So recognition that in the current climate, senior managers are having to find new ways to run the organisation, are working out a new model of loose and tight control of their leaders, are fighting a very difficult fight, and are themselves limited in what they can say and do. Thank you.